Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns & McDonnell. Pulsinelli, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by... Coming up, a new day for De La Salle. Also, the story of the Pakistani truck art project. Launching entrepreneurs with Spark Lab KC. And getting girls revved up about science. It's all ahead on The Local Show. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. Mason. Welcome to The Local Show. Kansas City wants to be the greatest place in America for entrepreneurs, but when the Greater Kansas City Chamber last year launched a series of public listening sessions on the issue, they found out that one of the biggest obstacles for startups is finding the capital to grow their businesses. Enter Spark Lab KC, where private investors are pooling their resources to help Kansas City startups. And as KCPT's Kyle Geary reports, a whole lot more. The sounds of keyboards furiously typing away and markers running across whiteboards may not sound like boot camp to you, but that's exactly what it is for entrepreneurs at Spark Lab KC. Started less than a year ago, they give 10 promising startups up to $18,000 in seed funding, free workspace, and a lot of mentoring in the intense 90-day program. Every company, every startup, uh, comes with just that little spark that gives that idea. This is John Stevens. He's the founder of the company that makes Neighbors Grow, a social home gardening application. He, along with the other startups, is presenting at Demo Day, where the companies make a final pitch for even more funding from a select group of angel investors. We connect neighbors, retailers, and the experts for a better growing experience. We're simply put, we're a farmer's almanac with Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that knowledge in one. What we're asking for is to collect $500,000 as part of this initial raise to bring on a chief technology officer that will guide that final programming to get us into beta launch and uh, continue to make them successful and reach our goals. Listening to John's pitch is Brian Matthews. He's the managing director of a venture fund in St. Louis and one of more than 100 investors attending Demo Day. He goes to a lot of events just like this, and he knows firsthand how important these programs are. Uh, almost every investment we make, uh, those companies have graduated from an accelerator program. So we think it is very important that uh, the companies go through that. In fact, we recommend uh, companies that we are interested to attend an accelerator program. I show up for my first day. It wasn't only entrepreneurs touting their ideas at Demo Day, though. Kansas City, Missouri Mayor Sly James gave the keynote speech and explained why organizations like Spark Lab KC are essential to the city. For the past few years, Kansas City has grown in recognition as a hub for entrepreneurship and innovation. And this is due in large part, I believe, to our entrepreneurial community and organizations like Spark Lab. Uh, who are filling that critical role of providing support and resources for our young startups. One of the people filling those roles is Kevin Fryer. He's one of the founders of Spark Lab KC and plays a very active role in the organization. Kansas City has been founded on entrepreneurship. If you look at the, 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 the bellwether companies, Hallmark, Cerner, Garmin, uh, DST, Kansas City Southern, they were all started by entrepreneurs. Uh, so if we can launch 10 new businesses a year, and if only one of those becomes as hugely successful as a Cerner or a Hallmark, then we've clearly done our job. Just to kind of put it into perspective, that's less so than one have they done their job? Christian Fisher is the CEO of Briefcase, one of the companies that went through the program. And he's experienced how Spark Lab has impacted his business. Goodness, when we entered into this program, we had a completely different product. Uh, you know, under Kevin, you know, Fryer's direction and, and Al and Ace and Don and and uh, and Mike, we've made a pivot and now we're 
experiencing a tremendous amount of success. So just by a show of hands. Out of all the companies in this class that completed the program, half of them are now in negotiations with venture capital firms, and two others have moved on to other business accelerators like Spark Lab KC. But only time will tell whether or not these startups become the next Hallmark or Cerner. For KCPT, I'm Kyle Gary. Spark Lab KC is now taking applications for its next class, which starts January 2014. For enrollment details, you can go to thelocalshow.org. By the way, more money is being thrown at startups in Kansas City. The Greater Kansas City Chamber recently announced as part of its Big Five initiative, the Flyover Capital Fund, where well-heeled investors have now pledged more than $25 million to help local entrepreneurs with more money to come. More details on how to access that cash on our website. Last week, De La Salle cut the ribbon on a new $8 million wing for the charter school, a wing which actually gives them a new address as well. 3737 Troost is now the official location of a school which has been on the scene since 1971, but has seen no major improvement since 1991. The local show's Krista Blackwood sat down with Executive Director Mark Williamson and De La Salle senior Michaela McIntosh to learn more. Mark, um, $8 million, it's a significant uh, capital investment, kind of shows you're building for a long haul. Did you look at moving to another neighborhood before you invested in, in rebuilding and expanding your current location? Well, there was some of that that, uh, that took place. You know, whenever you engage in a project that large, you want to consider all of your options. And, and uh, once it was fully vetted, uh, the, the call was made to uh, stay where we were at renovate the space that we're currently in and also add the addition uh, uh, to this space. And the main reasons for staying where you are? Well, we are, um, we're an urban core school. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, that's where your customer is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you take your business to your customer. And mm -hmm. so that's why we stayed where we were at. It's a fantastic renovation. Um, the amenities that you added with the expansion, was that decided before the expansion started or was the expansion considered and then you decided what to put in it? Well, we built it around the, we, we designed the project based on what we knew was the our, our students' current need mm -hmm. and also what we thought were some of the emerging needs. You, you really have one chance to get this thing right and so you want to maximize the gain from it, right? So so the first thing we looked at was this the students' needs. You know, what, what kind of tool do we need to build for, for these guys to be successful. And so when we designed the building, we designed that with, we, we designed, uh, made that design with, with those needs in mind. For example, the print shop was sort of shoved down in the basement into the corner of the building and, and it worked, but it was adequate. Uh, likewise with the Early Childhood Development Center, um, it was in a space that was adequate, but adequate's not okay. And so when we designed the, the new space, uh, we designed a space that was specific to uh, an early childhood development center. We designed a space that was specific to a, a student-operated uh, print shop. Just to give you an example of, of uh, the, I talked about the school as a, as a tool. Uh, something that's very clear in that respect is, is our library. Check that. I'm not allowed to call it a library. It's a media center mm -hmm. uh, for all the viewers. Remember, media center. <laughs> Uh, and and it's it it's a legitimate, uh, a, a legitimate uh, workspace for the for the students. And then the second thing we looked at was well, now that we're in the middle of this, it, what can we do to uh, be a good neighbor? You know, how can we expand uh, the 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 gain beyond the students? What else can we capture? And so we uh, we took a look at uh, this whole truce revitalization effort. Which is, which is fantastic, and we said, you know, we're about to build a new building here. Seems to me uh, we could do something to contribute to that revitalization. And so, uh, and so we did, you know, from 37th to Mannheim, uh, all along Troost, uh, that's our contribution to the effort. And then on the inside, we said, you know, we've got this space, we know that there are folks in our neighborhood who need places to meet or to convene and gather, and so we built uh, space with that in mind. Now, Michaela, what does this mean to you? You're a senior there. Have you been to another school besides De La Salle? Um, yes, well, my, from my freshman year, mm -hmm. I started at a school, and I, 
I hated this school. <laughs> we won't name it then. I'm not gonna name it. But, but what about it? Did you not like? It was. It was. It was a large school, mm -hmm. and the kids were crazy, mm -hmm. and so I would find reasons on not going to school, mm -hmm. and so I was just. I was tired of. I just could not stand this. So school. how did you find De La Salle? Um, through some ladies at our church. Okay. They had told us about the school and the students and we had tried it out. And so the very first day that I started, I was like, uh, that I coming out of the school that I was in, I was like, I was, I was kind of fed, fed up. Mm -hmm. And when I started there, I was my very first day, I was like, oh, I don't want to be here. I was tired of coming to school. Mm -hmm. By the second day, I, I was like, I think I could fit in with this school because it was a smaller environment, mm -hmm. so I liked being there. And the teachers, they were getting in, they were really helping me out too, so. And it's uh, 300 students for capacity, but you're at about 260 right that's, now? That's correct. So, um, so that's a small enough number for yes. you to be able to feel like you know most people who are there. Mm -hmm. When you came over here as a freshman, mm -hmm. and w what you thought of your future as a freshman, what's it like now, what's different? Well, before I was, I was not going to go to college. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I hate school. I don't want to go. But now, being where I am now, I kind of want to push to go to college now. So, I talked earlier about emerging needs of our students, and one of the things we're finding, which is wonderful, that more of our Michaelas are wanting to go on to post-secondary education, whether it's four-year, two-year technical right. training. Um, and so what we've done is, organizationally, positioned ourselves that we're able to provide the support that these students need uh, past high school. Uh, the end game back in in the day, the end game used to be just graduate from high school. Uh, the high school diploma will carry you. But we, we know those days are gone. And so we find it very encouraging that we've got students now who say, no, I, I really do want to go on to college. And so it becomes an incumbent upon us to make sure that Michaela has the exposure uh, college tours and help with financial aid and some of that planning that goes on uh, so that she can be successful. Otherwise, it can be a pretty mind-blowing experience to have to fly it solo. And, uh, and uh, you know, so it's encouraging that, that we've got these students who are interested in post-secondary ed. Very exciting. What's the best thing about the expansion from your perspective as a student? It feels more like a high school now. Yeah. If going in there, from seeing the building before then, it is so different from going in there. Like the very first day I started, I was like, "Wow, this is this is really nice." They did a lot of work on it, and it really looks good. Good. Well, thank you both for being here. I congratulate you on your success, and look forward to seeing you in the future somewhere amazing. So keep on going. It's nice to have you here on the local show. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, there's always a lot going on at the Nelson Atkins Museum, but right now seems particularly busy. Julian Zugazagordia has his own TV show, Art Tasting, that's running on Wednesday nights here on KCPT. And he's very excited by the news of a major gift to the museum, over 150 photographs by native Kansas Cityan David Douglas Duncan from his Picasso collection. Also, they've been hard at work in Kirkwood Hall this week, building the altar for the Day of the Dead celebration, which opens Friday and culminates with a big family festival at the museum on Sunday, November 3rd. And as the Islamic Art Exhibition, which opened in August, continues its run, you may have noticed an unusual truck parked outside the block building. A Pakistani cargo truck created by artist Ashir Akram. Kansas City star photographer Rich Sugg followed the process of building this wildly colorful sculpture on wheels, both in stills and video. The star's picture editor for multimedia, Monty Miller, produced the piece, and we're happy to share it with you here on The Local Show. <laughs> It's a scene you might commonly see in Karachi. In Kansas City, less likely. Welcome. You made it. A brightly colored cargo truck, more than twice as tall as a man, a feat of engineering, a work of art, the end product of what's called the Pakistani Cargo Truck Initiative. 
For months, artist Ashir Akram and his friends have painstakingly assembled this working version of a truck used every day in Pakistan. Using funds from Kickstarter and other supporters, Ashir bought a 1950s era grain truck, hacked at its frame, rebuilt and repainted the cab and hood, then decked the flatbed with soaring metal decorations, bright paint, fanciful design. We're, we're good there. How are we on that backside? While I was in Pakistan, I came across these trucks in, in such a such a bleak and desolate backdrop. These trucks are rolling museums. They are galleries on wheels. It is just it's kind of uh, a subculture that not a lot of people get to experience because not a lot of people get to travel to places like that. And I, I believe that the, the experience that I had on that trip to both places uh, has really defined the way I would like to continue to create art. I began building the truck before we actually um, had acquired any funding whatsoever. I, um, I found the 1952 Chevy in Salina, Kansas. I paid, I think, eight, eight or nine hundred bucks. It wasn't a lot, but it was a heap. It barely ran. It had a straight six still in it. It had been hand-painted John Deere colors, uh, green and yellow. That's where our journey really began. It was just sitting in a field rusting away. So what we decided to do, we were going to cut the whole uh, 52 cab in half and widen it two feet to make it fit on the newer style chassis. That, that was a big undertaking. That, that was probably um, about 30 to 40 percent of the time that we spent on this truck has been on the sheet metal work. Cutting a truck in half and remaking um, you know, a fourth of it and making it look like it was made that way is not an easy task. We would get to one point in our journey and it would escalate quickly. We would say, hey, this isn't big enough, or hey, this isn't right. Or somebody would come up with an idea and I would say, hey, that's great, let's roll with it, let's see what it does. So the short of it is $40,000 went in about two months and um, we had a lot more fundraising to do. and. Our <clears throat> deadlines that we initially set kind of went to the wayside because the project gained so much um, mass momentum. It got so big so quickly, it was really hard to financially keep up with it. You know, it, it's real difficult to try to create, you know, a Shear's vision or try to do, you know, try to work with him on what is in his head when we're both trying to, you know, split the responsibility. We feed off of each other with our creativity and he comes up with ideas and I'm like, well, we can do it or we can do it this way or he says, you know, I've got this idea. You know, we, we figure it out together and we both, you know, are very good troubleshooters. Kevin has time and time again um, put a lot of things to the side that um, that a lot of people wouldn't to make my priorities his priorities. Uh, and this truck being one of them, he has worked alongside me for 18 hour days, time and time and time again. Um, what's hard is what you haven't done yet. Everything we did yesterday was easy. So it's kind of a daily basis of problem solving. And as long as everybody's creating solutions in the stead of problems, everybody Everybody seems to progress through days easier. The work has been slow and at times difficult. The small downtown Kansas City garage can be stiflingly hot or bitterly cold. But the team keeps its eyes on the goal, a piece of moving art that can teach others about a foreign way of life. We did come up with a very unique crew of specialized craftsmen and artists, uh, and I'm, I'm blessed to, to have met the people that I've met 
during my time in Kansas City, a lot of the people that have come to the table have really shown up and they've really done an out outstanding job. They've went above and beyond um, what I expected them to do and what they were asked to do initially. And what Ashir came to me and wanted me to be part of on his truck was, was the stained glass um, aspect. I think part of the truck is all about color and bling and excitement and lights. And so I'm so proud to be part, part of, of the truck and, and this very part of it because Ashir has asked me to do the eyebrow of the truck. He had this idea that the eyebrow should be colored glass and he's gonna light this at night and oh my, it's just, it's just wonderful. I thought I would make the knobs and I made uh, like uh, water lilies or lotus flowers. So it's, it's a, I think it's an interesting uh, idea because the idea of the lotus is one petal, one petal, things keep opening like an onion and coming forth and it's about all the people coming together and all the parts. He sort of gave me creative license with just sort of the understanding that it was Midwest themed. Going back to the Native American traditions and animal symbolism therein, uh, I started kind of thinking about portraying this bigger truth with animals, sort of like um, what had been done in places all over the world pre-writing, you know? How do you tell a story or parables with animals as symbols? Ashir says he plans to drive the truck on the Kansas City streets. It will be an actual work vehicle for a time before it winds up as an art exhibit somewhere. Ultimately, the Pakistani cargo truck may be seen as an act of love, a love of art, of country, of culture, an act the team will now share with the world. My curiosity about Pakistan was, of course, because my dad was born and raised in Lahore. He's really taken his roots up and expanded it in the best way possible. It's really remarkable. I just can't say how proud I am of him. So many people these days, they get fixed on the small things in life, and it's not how you should live your life. You know, you should explore and you should test yourself and you should push and you shouldn't always follow the rules. You should make your own rules sometimes. So I think, you know, in the end, my, this has really helped me come out of my shell. You know, the way I look at what I do and what I can do with it. Maybe, maybe op open somebody else's eyes as well. Another way of bringing different cultures together and explaining them and seeing some positive things, which is what we don't see in the news, about another culture, which is absolutely thrilling. Wow, when it's not out and about on assignment, Ashia's Pakistani cargo truck will be parked at the museum through April. There's also a model of it in the Creative Cafe. As we wrap up this edition of The Local Show, we've got STEM on our mind. Yes, while more women than men graduate with bachelor degrees, fewer pursue degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math. Recently, thanks to the KC STEM Alliance, 38 young women from area high schools took a turn at drilling, sawing, and suturing in hopes of getting a glimpse into what a STEM career might offer. Take a look. We'll see you next week. Today has given me an opportunity to get an insight of how my future could look like if I went to the medical field to go into or orthopedics. The Perry Initiative was started five years ago uh, by myself. I'm an engineer and uh, a surgeon friend of mine. And um, we were concerned that there just weren't enough women uh, in our fields. And um, so we started by, in, uh, by inviting some girls into my lab. Uh, and then that just grew. The three activities uh, this morning were suturing. So they had a patient with a severe laceration that they had to stitch up. Uh, they did an external fixator for a broken femur, which is part of the leg. And then they also uh, fixed uh, a patient with scoliosis, which is a spinal curvature. My favorite was the stitching, being able to see stuff up front. Bones are interesting, but I feel like if you see flesh and everything else, it gets a little bit more interesting. 
I think it's great because a lot of opportunities come for guys and it's not a lot for women to get exposure to. And this being here and it being for free, and it's just, it's just easy. It's just an opportunity that's easily being able to take. So I'm happy about that. Having a role model, having somebody who can show them, yeah, they can do it and it's fun and they like what they do, is really important. Um, and, and I think at this age, seeing a woman doing it, is, is, it really speaks to them much more than seeing a guy doing it. We ran our first follow-up study this past summer, uh, and we looked at the kids that have gone on to college, which is pretty much all of the kids who, who uh, are of age to go of college, who've been through the program or in college. 85% um, of them are in STEM majors, uh, and 21% uh, are engineers, which warms my heart, and 45% are pre-med. You know, a lot of these girls, even three, four years out, have said, this is the Perry Initiative uh, had an influence in my life um, at a critical time to show me that these were these were options for me. And now you are the the ninja of the drill. Okay, you can be a ninja. You'll be a drill ninja. Principal funding for the local show provided by Francis Family Foundation. Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns & McDonnell, Pulsinelli, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by...